Mr. Crispin here once again. In today's video we're going to take a look at turning a conical feature or more specifically how to position a conical feature during a turning operation and the inspiration to this video was a friend of mine who had got a component to machine, he'd got some drawings and he was a little unsure how to proceed and after my advice he was probably even more unsure how to proceed but I'll let you make your own minds up. Um, anyway, I've done some thinking, I've come up with a method, I'm going to show two applications for the method and we're going to turn a component on camera uh, to a drawing so I can show you how it all works. And it's basically a plane diameter and an angle. Uh, here's one I made earlier. Now it's a simple component but there was a sticking point and the question went something like this. When I'm on the lathe how do I know that this 31.5 millimetre dimension is correct and therefore that all the other components of the angles are correct and really there's um, not much you can do on the lathe other than trying to hold a pair of calipers up to it and saying oh yeah I think that's about right so in this video I'm going to show a method or two methods for actually positioning the machine properly so that you can achieve dimensions with some confidence. Now first of all we're going to have a look at the drawing. So we've got this 31 and a half showing the um, size of circle you should be left with on the end face and that's uh, handy but I'm actually going to uh, look at this a bit differently. We have here an angle and this is actually part of a cone. So if you imagine uh, those being extended okay we have a, uh, a full cone rolling something like that and when you're dealing with cones or angles it's handy to use gauge points so I'm actually going to use the dimensions given here to construct gauge points that I can then work to so we know that when you are 20 mil up from the datum face and you are 31.5 millimeters between two points your cone position should be correct to this face and that's pretty much all we need from the drawing. Uh, we can then give ourselves some other information. So we need an angle and you've basically got a triangle here and a triangle here. 20 millimetres minus 8 millimetres gives you 12 millimetres there. And 49 millimetres minus 31.5 divided by 2 gives you 8.75 on each side. Now if you do the Sokotoa on this, uh, you actually get an angle here, which is what we want for the uh, machine, of 36.098 degrees. And uh, I'm going to be doing this on the Myford lathe and I'm going to be using the top slide to do it. So I need a top slide angle of 36.098. So that's all the information required. Um, but how am I actually going to approach this on the machine? Well, what we're really looking at is how to remove this segment. Um, if you visualise your component in the lathe, uh, we need to remove this segment of material. And um, the method I'm going to show, first of all, is to bring the tool in and reference the cross slide on a known diameter. Bring the tool in to the end face and reference the saddle on a known face and once you've done that you've then got the zero point and from there you can increment in and top slide across increment in top slide across increment in top slide across uh, and I'm going to show the specific details of all the setups as we go because there's a few important details um, but to reiterate we're going to find the diameter find the face and we can then work to basically um, our calculated numbers. I will just say that there's obviously numerous ways to do this. I had a piece of material about the right thickness so in this case what I've done is I've turned the face and the diameter and then reversed it in the chuck to uh, complete the job. Uh, you may argue it would have been better to have a longer piece of material, put the face on, put the diameter on and put the angle on in one go you uh, are almost guaranteed good con concentricity that way. So we'll go over to the lathe where I have already turned the face and the diameter and you'll notice that I've actually put a groove in um, here what is effectively rough material at the moment so that when I flip it 
I've got something to indicate to sort any axial run out out. So I'm almost ready to put this back in the chuck and carry on. But before I do, I'm going to set the top slide angle. Now for accurately setting top slide angles, my favourite method is to um, copy or match something. So if I was trying to replicate this taper, I would set it up somehow so that it's running true. And then using a clock on the tool post, I would tram in the top slide until it was running parallel to that angle. And that's an accurate way to do it, but you need to have something to copy. In this case, I don't have anything to copy, so I'm going to use a sign bar. So I've got one roller off the four jaw chuck and the other roller on a slip gauge stack of four inches and 40 thou, which actually gives me the 36.098 angle. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I can now use a clock to uh, set everything up accurately. So I can uh, turn this to 36 and a bit. I'm just going to nip these up for now. And then I'm going to mount a clock on the back here. So with the clock set up there, I can um, dial it into zero. And I'm now going to wind the cross slide back and forth until I get it uh, parallel. And uh, that's not actually a very good example because I think I've got it in one. Yeah, somehow that's within half a thou. But what I would do if that was out is I would um, make some adjustments here until I'd got the cross slide running parallel to the sign bar. But that's it now, the top slide is set at an angle of 36.098 degrees within half a thou and uh, we can move on. And you can see there the uh, idea behind the radial groove for purposes of uh, alignment checking. So I've roughed this face out, I've still to take a finishing cut but I can now set the top slide up ready for my um, positional moves. So I need to make sure I've got enough travel in the direction I want, um, which will be starting back there. And I'm going to zero it out um, to my zero. Okay, so I can now make my moves. Um, I'm going to feed the cross slide in to the diameter till I touch on. Zero the cross slide. Then come across here and set up for my finishing cut. Once I'm in position, I'm going to lock the saddle. I'm going to take the finishing cut and return the tool to down here. From then, all moves will be done with either the cross slide or the top slide, so the saddle will not be moving, and I'll be incrementing in with the cross slide and feeding across with the top slide all the way till I reach the finished size. And the reason the saddle not moving is important is it allows me to work to this side of the triangle with the cross slide. So if that was 8.75, I feed in 8.75 and I um, end up in the right place. Now, there's one detail in this infeed amount that I've yet to uh, explain and see if you can guess what that is. So I'm coming over here and once I've touched on and zeroed the dial I'm going to move to a different spot and come back and touch on again and make sure the dial reads zero. Okay, that's fine. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to set up for my finish cut. I'm going to lock the saddle and I'm going to take the finishing cut. So that's that and whether you um, lock the saddle, zero a readout, set a stop, whatever you normally do, that's fine as long as you know the relationship between that face and the tool. So, from my zeroed position on the cross slide, all I need to do now is keep incrementing in and feeding across with the top slide. The only question remaining is what number am I aiming for with the cross slide? Well, I'm not sure if you've guessed or not, but here goes the explanation. We found our radius or diameter here. We found our end position here. And that gives us a theoretical square corner. But the tool has a radius on it. 
as uh, a lot of turning tools do you can see there's a small radius on the end and so if we track our uh, calculated square corner across the maths works out perfectly for a square corner but a radius tool would actually result in metal being left on so if I traverse across here at my calculated distance 8.75 for that leg of the triangle I'm actually going to be leaving metal on because the radius is not in the same place as that square corner. So there's a bit of maths involved to calculate the additional infeed required. So if you imagine here, if I'm feeding in with a cross slide, I need to actually feed in um, that distance there. And there's a bit of trigonometry involved. Rather than disrupting the explanation with it now, I'm going to make an addendum video to this where I go through it. It's uh, fairly common in CNC turning and that's where I learned about it because any interpolation or profiling work you have to account for the discrepancy here. Um, the maths for doing it manually I actually got off uh, Joe Pysinski video and I'm going to put a link to that video in the description but I will do an addendum video for this specific component where I go through the maths and that will be released shortly after this one. All I'm going to say for this video is as I'm uh, incrementing down this side of the triangle I need to go in an extra 0.19 millimeters with the cross slide to put the radius on the line I'm trying to hit. And there I have 8.94 So uh, it's all just about triangles really uh, and that sort of concludes method one um, and that's probably good for 90% of occasions but what would happen if you uh, couldn't reference off this diameter or more importantly you wanted to check the sizes out before you actually reach your finished cut. Well if you do want to check your uh, finished cut out before you take it or this is cast or square or hexagonal or you can't really measure it properly then how about putting a reference diameter on the other end so this is a diameter basically working off the triangle again imagine our triangle here that we had um, a given distance for I'm basically going to turn a reference diameter to that size I can check that diameter with a micrometer and make sure it's very accurate before I actually work from it and equally I can check this face back to my datum at the other end of the component to make sure this gauge point is as good as I can get um, before I take the final cut. So my um, shoulder is now turned to uh, pretty much 20mm and uh, the diameter is uh, also there Excuse my uh, my commenter technique, I've got a tripod where I don't normally have a tripod. And uh, yeah, we're down to 31.12 on the diameter. So I can now uh, proceed to rough this out and prepare for the finishing cut. So we're all roughed out, we've got about a thou left on. And what I can do now is I can come back over to my diameter and check that the dial still reads zero at the intersection point I need it to and that's uh, very close to so I'm going to go for it at this so I'm still set up on zero I'm going to come back in till my saddle reaches a saddle's position and lock the saddle So that's it, I'm at my calculated cross slide position and calculated uh, saddle position so all I can do now is take the finishing cut. So there we have our uh, cone and all that remains is to remove this uh, surplus material on the front a break edge to finish and that's it we're all done 
So that isn't the simplest way of turning a cone or a conical feature but if you're trying to work to certain dimensions and you need some confidence that you've achieved those dimensions then that is how I would approach it. Um, by all means if you have a better method or if you think it was over complicated or you liked it let me know in the comments and um, there will be two videos following this one. One will be showing the trigonometry in detail for anyone who's interested and the other one will be doing a full inspection of the component. I'm going to get it on the surface table, check all the angles out, check the cone positions out and uh, go through the drawing. I hope you found something there of interest. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.